welcome you to Digging Into the Future. Today we've got Dave Schaefer, the CEO and Chairman of Cogent, and a gentleman who has uh, been a, a pioneer in the fiber space and, and one of our longest standing CEOs and senior executives in the field. And we're really excited to have a few minutes to chat with him today uh, about uh, where he sees the industry going and, and where he sees the opportunities uh, across the spectrum of our industry. Dave, Dave welcome. Well, thank you, Bill. I'd like to thank your audience and really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you today. Oh, thanks. So, Dave, tell me about uh, where is Cogent you know, today? I know you just went through a big uh, merger, right? You're, you're, uh, you're heading in a, in a new direction, I guess. Uh, what's, what's the status? Where are you? And how you know, what's, what's the next, how's it look for the next 12 months or so? Yeah, I think we're adding to the basic Cogent business model. Cogent is a global internet service provider. We operate a network that touches 54 countries, roughly 80,000 route miles of inner city fiber connected to another 18,600 miles of metropolitan fiber, nearly 230 markets across our footprint, 1,600 data centers connected to our network, and nearly a billion square feet of multi-tenant office space where we sell high-speed internet and VPN services. We had the opportunity to buy the Sprint Global Markets Group business from T-Mobile. When T-Mobile <laughs> had acquired Sprint for its wireless business, they got the original Sprint backbone business. That was a network that was built at a capital cost of over $20 billion in the late 1980s and was basically dormant. We acquired that network and are now integrating it into the Cogent network. It's also given us the ability to expand our product offering. So in addition to internet VPN services, we've dramatically improved our co-location offering. We have 100 data centers, nearly 230 megawatts of power, and 1.9 million square feet of coach and proprietary facilities. And we are now in the optical transport business, selling wavelengths, which is something that Cogent for 23 years had not done. Right. So exciting times. Yeah, no, it sounds like some new new initiatives. Uh, and it's, it's interesting, so, uh, you know, Obviously, the digital infrastructure space right now is probably one of the hottest, uh, you know, topics among investors. And, and actually, if you think about it, probably one of the best performing, uh, you, you know, in the equity markets. If you look at it, uh, the six largest uh, tech companies today are, are uh, represent something like 65 percent of all the market capitalization of the United States. Um, but. Many people say that the fiber side of it, although it's the glue that basically holds it all together, has generally been undervalued uh, for the last few years, right? And, and uh, why do you think that is? I mean, because I think a lot of, uh, I mean, it's interesting. I, I personally have been from the fiber space, and, and uh, when you look at the complexity and the importance to the digital infrastructure space, fiber is, is absolutely critical. And yet it doesn't get, I don't think it gets the value that in, from investors. Um, and and what's, what's your thought process as to why that would be? Well, not only does it not get the recognition from investors, you know, I think end users who rely on the internet for every aspect of their life don't really understand the plumbing behind the curtain that actually makes the internet work. And that is fiber optics. So. Uh, you know, I think there's two reasons why investors have struggled with the sector. The first is the overhang of the original telecom period of overinvestment and ultimate meltdown in that sector and the value that was destroyed from those uh, investments. I think the second challenge has been that while the world benefits from fiber to the premise, a fiber overbuilder struggles with competing with the multiple technologies that already exist, whether it's twisted pair, coax, fixed wireless, or mobile, or even satellite, each of these are competitors at some level to fiber. Now, fiber is a technologically superior medium, 
But because your costs are proportional to homes or businesses passed, and your revenue is only proportional to those served, unless you get a significant market penetration quickly, you don't earn a high enough rate of return. So I think investors have been taking this wait and see attitude to make sure that the sales and marketing side keeps up with the technology. One of the interesting things, and it'll be interesting to get your perspective, because you, you, like myself, lived through the, the meltdown. Um, would the, the five or six big over-the-top players be here today if it hadn't been for the meltdown of uh, 2000? You know? I could categorically say they would not. Uh, so the Internet is a public good. It has tremendous externalities, benefits to others that don't pay for the infrastructure. And many of those large companies have figured out how to develop applications that ride on the internet that create value for them, create value for the consumer, but don't necessarily accrete value to the network operator, which has been a huge challenge. In the legacy network platforms, they lived in a closed world where regulation protected them and rates were promulgated. In an open world, such as we have today with the internet, applications flourish, barriers to entry are low, and the economic value usually goes to either the consumer or those handful of large platform companies that have figured out how to extract a global marketplace and use customers as their leverage. So the $2 trillion that was lost globally in the telecom meltdown actually has created probably 10x that in economic value for the world. But those who receive the value are different than those who have lost it. Well, let's, let's, let's uh, for our final uh, little line of questioning here, let's talk about the term that we talk, uh, we call artificial intelligence, which uh, I think you would argue is not really a great term, um, you know, for what's really happening in the world, but, but more just in some ways maybe just uh, faster uh, databases that uh, people are actually having access to or having access to the human database uh, that's around the world. Um, what do you think is the future? I mean, it's probably uh, you know the most talked about area right now, and it's actually uh, in the investment community and in the and in the infrastructure industry. It's where we're putting our money, trying to to see where that next uh, area of growth is. So just as we will have self-driving cars or flying cars, we will have cognitive machines that can't think the way humans think, and maybe even faster. But that's not what artificial intelligence is today. What artificial intelligence is today is the use of huge databases that have been collected at a very low cost over the internet that are the raw material for training machines. Those machines now have become sufficiently powerful that they can manipulate these databases, they can build large language models, and effectively determine patterns of behavior out of those random sets of data. Those patterns then allow us to project into future events, what will happen. That is AI as we know it today. We are only scratching the surface on the data that we currently have, and the databases are being expanded exponentially every day because of the internet. You know, the concept of having privacy has gone away, all of individuals' actions are collected, and it is from those collective activities that these patterns are being deduced. Now, those training machines are now starting to evolve to their second phase, which is taking the patterns that they have developed 
and now making inferences from that. And we're going to see that permeate every aspect of human life and even machine-to-machine interactions. So it won't be a standalone technology, but it'll be embedded in every technology. Much the way the internet is not really a standard technology. It's embedded in the other technologies. And the internet is the glue that holds that together. You're going to see AI be the glue of many other process and workflow improvements that will make us more efficient. Remember, the goal of innovation is to get more out of less, to distribute that, to raise everybody's standard of living. Just as the internet has pulled billions of people out of poverty, AI will pull another wave of people out. It may not seem that way at first, but the innovation in every aspect of productivity that will come from AI will benefit us all. Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you uh, with us here on Digging Into the Future, and uh, thanks for giving us some insight. It's been a, been a great chat. Thank hey, you thanks, so much. Bill. Thank you all very much. <laughs>